Right, so the unstageable pressure ulcers. Now, today we are officially launching this national audit. Um, we've called it a national audit, but actually we're not proud. And if anybody from any other country wanted to come and join in, we wouldn't mind in the slightest. Um, but it's really very important for the UK for a whole number of reasons. But first of all, I want to just make the point that, yes, I'm standing up here being the important person, but I'm not the only person on the working group. And so Julie Evans from Wales, Linda Primer from Scotland, um, Dawn Squires and Nikki Stubbs from, the UK, uh, from England are also part of the working group. So the background on this. Um, it, it's really quite interesting because when we first started um, getting really involved with pressure ulcer classification, it was just really a bit of an exercise that we used when we did prevalence surveys. And it didn't actually matter if we didn't get it quite right because, you know, it was for a prevalence survey. And yes, you wanted the information, but actually now it's all changing or has all changed because of the whole variety of monitoring schemes that there are across the UK. Um, I don't really want to go around and list all of them, but they're all up there. Um, and as is obvious from what Jane was saying earlier, there are one or two problems with some of them. Um, and certainly we need to improve the accuracy in our reporting. Um, and the major concern to me is the way that we have to collect things differently, depending on, and talk about postcode lottery, um, because in some parts of England, trusts are required to report all unstageable pressure ulcers as a category three, and in other places, a category four. In some trusts are not reporting or counting either deep tissue injury or unstageable damage in any of their audit figures. Other trusts report them but only when they know what the true depth is. Um, and that could be several months down the line for some of these. So it's just a real mess. Scotland and Wales are a little bit more organised in what they have to report. Um, in Scotland, it's, they have to report all hospital-acquired pressure ulcers, grade two and above. Um, and those, that, those figures go in centrally to NHS Scotland. And in Wales, um, they have to re report all category three and four as serious untoward incidents, and that goes directly to the Welsh Government. But even so, it still, it still just feels that everybody's doing something different everywhere. And the biggest problem for me is that we actually don't know anything very much at all about the outcomes for unstageable pressure ulcers. The only thing we've got is a bit of anecdotal in, in, um, information, which basically is when you sat chatting around a table and you say, oh, well, I had one and this is what happened. Um, and that's about the limit of the uh, information that we have um, because nobody's ever monitored them. So it's a huge gap in our knowledge and we're making judgments on no knowledge when we're talking about these. So that's the whole purpose for TVS in running this um, national audit, to find out what happens to unstageable pressure ulcers. We're not including device-related injuries or deep tissue injuries um, in this audit, mostly because I said so, but that's not the only reason. It's very logical reasons because um, what happens with those is completely different pathway. So we're just looking at unstageable. Now, it's been absolutely brilliant. We put a notice up on the website and information was sent out in the newsletters about this. And so far, we've got over 100 people who have expressed an interest in participating in this audit. Um, and I just think that's absolutely fab. It'd be even more so if we got more people, because we'd like as many as possible. But, you know, that's just... But it also shows how much this information is needed. Because, you know, everybody's busy. They don't put their name, hand up to say they want to do something if they don't think it's important. So, this is what we're going to be doing. Now, we're going to be collecting the data over a six-month period because otherwise you could just drift and you could do it forever. So, it's a very fixed six-month period. 
and we will be asking you to collect information on pressure ulcers, um, unstable pressure ulcers, their weekly progress and the final outcome. And that's the really, really important thing, what happens to them in the end. The minute they're un that you can actually classify them uh, other than as unstageable, then we know what the outcome is. So it's not to healing, it's only to find out what happens to them. So we have to recognise that it may take a number of weeks. I mean, we can all think of patients um, where it's taken a number of weeks for us to actually be able to properly classify um, a pre the pressure ulcer. So this is going to be really important. It, we, I will come back to this in a moment, but we're really only expecting each person who participates to follow up one patient because it could go on for a while. So we're not asking everybody to do vast numbers. We just want lots and lots of people to do one or two. And you need to therefore pick your patient so that you're picking a patient that if they move from where you are, if you're in community, are they like, oops, go into a hospital. Go into a hospital where you could, you've got contacts with the tissue viability team in the hospital and so you can get them to carry on following the patient up for you. If you're in the hospital, don't pick a patient who's going to be transferred to the other end of the country because you can't follow them up. Pick a patient that's going to go out to your local community so that you can keep on following them up or they can help you follow them up. Uh, you know, for the, so we actually find out what's going on. It's really important, therefore, um, be realistic about what you can do. We're not asking you to say up front, oh, I can do 20. Don't want that. We want one or two followed up really accurately. And so you need to, you need to make sure when you choose a patient that it's actually feasible. Now, I don't know whether Sue's actually pressed the send button yet, but is, there is lined up an email that is going out to every person who uh, filled in the expression of interest form that they will be sent um, this, an email which will give them a link onto the correct page on the website so that they can sign up officially to take part in the project. Um, if you didn't fill in an expression of interest, it doesn't matter, you can just go to the website, find it and still fill it in. Now, this is what the um, front page will look like. Um, so, there you go. And then here, there are the different forms that you will fill in. So, this is your, if your centre would like to participate in the audit, please click here to sign up and that will give you the sign up form. And then underneath that is clicking to register a patient and then um, the weekly upload form. So we, I, want, I hope that you won't feel that any of this is going to be onerous as, as we go through it. But the idea is to make it reasonably streamlined and to, to get everything, all the data, filled in online. So once you fill in the sign-up form, you'll be given guidance on how to actually complete the audit. So you're not just sort of sent off with no information. You will then uh, get an email sent to you which will have your centre number on it. And the centre number is really, really important because of the way that you fill in forms on the, uh, like this on the internet. You, each time you go in, you're not adding on to that form. So unless you say the centre number and the patient number we won't be able to use your data. So it's really, really important that you use that. You also, um, when you get the email, you will be given a patient registration form to download so that you can take that to the bedside with you, fill in the information, and then go back and transfer it on, online, um, which gives you a, one, a record of the patient, but also uh, stops you forgetting what it was you saw between the time you saw the patient and the time you get to your computer. Um, but it's, the aim is not to make it time consuming. Now, 
As a very, there's a few practical points to think out. I've already said that you may have to follow up patients for some weeks. Um, and you also need to recognise that even if your patient stays in the same healthcare setting, you might choose to have a holiday. And we're starting this now and going on for six months. And we will shortly be approaching the summer holiday period before we know where we are. So it may well be advisable that you find a friend who will also help you to um, by picking up and uh, following up the patient whilst you're on holiday. Um, I mentioned you need to put a patient number. We're not going to give you a patient number, it's up to you. But if you're centre 26, only you will be putting into centre 26. So everybody can call their patients 01 because nobody else will be using the centre number. So you automatically call your first patient 01. If you choose to do a second patient, that becomes 02. Oh, wrong one. So I wanted to just show you what the forms for the data collection look like. Now, these are the printed out ones. They won't look exactly like this on the website, um, but it will be just basic information to start with. So the date, centre number, patient number. I can't actually read that up there, so I've got to look at this. Um, the name of the assessor, because again, it's a way of aud well, you know, trailing back because we need to be able to keep making sure that what we've collected is, you know, when we accumulate all the information, we need to make sure that we've got the same patient all the way through. So name of assessor, the usual PO, um, pressure ulcer assessment tool that you use, just so that we know, so what, whatever that may be, um, the position of the pressure ulcer, and a description of the pressure ulcer. Now, those pictures are very small, so I'm going to show you some bigger pictures in a moment. Um, and just also major risk factors and very brief statement on the origins of the pressure ulcer. So it might be fell at home. It might be condition deteriorated, those things. Or if you're not sure, just put not sure. doesn't matter. So that's the information you collect in the first instance. And then the weekly um, assessment is the same stuff again, date, centre number, name of assessor, patient number, and then the day number. So in other words, if this is the first time you do it, you put 07. If it's the second week, it's 14, and so on. Um, and then the important question, is the pressure ulcer still unstageable? Yes or no? If it's yes, then you need to carry on with the weekly assessments. If it's no, we need to know what it is. So then you tick the box below as to whether it's categories one to four or it tax skin, because very occasionally that may be the situation. The other thing we also need to know, and it's slightly different on the website, but we also need to know if the patient gets lost to follow-up, why? Um, because unfortunately, in a perfect world, we do lose patients to follow-up. Um, it might be the patient's been transferred out of your area, in which case there's nothing you can do about it, um, although maybe that's not the best patient to have chosen in the first place. Um, but the other thing, of course, is sadly, some of these patients will die because, you know, they are sick people. So... Um, but it's helpful to know these things. So that really is the main information that we are collecting for the audit. So hopefully you won't feel that that is too complicated. Um, I promised that I would show you better, uh, better sized pictures of the um, descript description of the pressure ulcers. So, oh, I pressed the wrong button. Um, so... There's a choice between thick black eschar, thin eschar, and cavity filled with necrosis and slough. And we thought that it was worthwhile including the pictures on the forms just so that you've got a reminder um, when you go and look at the patient. Um, just another point, when you fill on the 
fill in the online form, you will be asked for your email address each time. And that is so that you can get an email notification that your data has been received, which is always quite nice because when you press a button online, you never quite know whether it gets there or not. Um, the other point that I would also like to stress, you might be a TVN in the community and your centre number is 67. And you might be good mates with the local hospital and they're also in the audit and their centre number is 68. One of your patients who's in the audit deteriorates and has to be sent into hospital. They still keep the same centre number. So when you send them in, you need to make sure that your friend in the hospital knows to use your centre number and not her centre or his centre number. Okay, that's really important, otherwise we'll just lose the plot um, with the patients. So, what's going to happen to the data? <coughs> well, it's all going to be collated and analysed and form part of a report. TVS is funding this study, this project, and therefore TVS trustees will get first dibs at looking at the report. However, it will also be presented um, at the TVS conference, well, the TVS bit of humour next year, so that everybody um, who comes to that will be able to see it. But of course, not everybody gets to go to conferences. Um, I, I am well aware of that. So the findings will also be published, hopefully in the Journal of Tissue Viability, assuming that the paper is of good enough quality to be accepted. No, it's true has to go through very rigorous um, look at by uh, the, the uh, reviewers. Um, so, I hope you feel energised at the thought of participating in this. We really, really hope that you all feel that you would like to join in. And that means that you don't forget about it when you get back home. Because it's very easy to think, oh, yes, I'll do that. And then you go home, you get back on duty, and there's 20 patients for you to see, and you forget all about it. Um, we will be reminding people. <laughs> but um, I do hope that you, you feel excited by it. I think it's going to be a really worthwhile project. And I did have another slide which said, any questions? So I'll leave it on that. So are there any questions that anybody would like to ask about it? Yes, Ria. Can you just... It's actually a quite a simple question, and it's about um, people registering yes. for centres. Because there's lots of different members from Tissue Viability Society, and I'm just wondering what happens if you've got different members registering for the same centre, because we're going to have difficulty managing the numbers yeah. if we don't know about each other. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully, if you were, say... Um, a ward nurse, you wouldn't register your ward without talking to your TVN. I hope that wouldn't happen. I realise that not everybody talks to each other. Um, it's going to be, it will be difficult to vet, except that we will have the name of the institution for um, each person that signs in. Um, whether we recognise it, I don't know. Um, I hadn't thought about that, to be quite honest. Oh, yeah. Same centre? Yeah. Uh, be a name, but same centre. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that, that may be something that we... But I would hope that people talk to each other. Well, I'll say, if you are... Um, you know that there's other people in your institution or your healthcare setting that are also part of TVS and you need to talk to each other. If you all want to participate, it would be great. Um, perhaps I'll also put a little plea out. I'm just going to notice there's one or two people from industry around the room. Can you mention it when you're out and about? Can you tell other people about it and encourage them to participate? Everything's on the website. You only have to point them in that direction, and that would be fab. Thank you. <laughs>